I'm bigger and stronger than Ronnie Coleman. I, I'm more educated than Albert Einstein. I know more things than Albert Einstein. All right. Greetings, fellow iron enthusiasts. In today's video, I'm going to do probably something very unique. I'll try to explain science-based lifting. What science-based lifting really is and why did it fail? You can divide any science by two different parts. Theory and practice. Those beloved studies. I'm going to do this exercise because the recent study shows 1.3% more muscle growth if you lean 90 degrees angle and... So, first theory. Can you base your lifting upon it? The thing is that you can describe your lifting with theory, but it does not mean that you can base it upon the theory because people have this common misconception. And it coming from the very teenage perception of science. The ability to use uh, chemicals, yeah. pharmaceuticals, atoms and molecules. You know, when you're like 14, 16 years old, you kind of pro-science, you feel very nihilistic, and you probably watch some National Geographic Discovery channels, reading Wikipedia articles, and you think that you can prove everything with science. Science is just one of the ways to, let's just say, operate with knowledge, using some scientific methods, basically. It does not mean universal truth or it's the best way of doing things and on and on. So, you can describe literally everything with science, but it does not mean that everything is science. Like, guys, I'm standing in front of you. I'm speaking. You can describe what's going on now using a bunch of different signs, but it does not mean that I'm doing science now. Science does not mean sport. Because science, as already concluded, is just one of the ways to operate with knowledge. Sport is just a mastery or a craft. For instance, you can describe music with science using mathematics and physics, but it does not mean that learning physics and mathematics will make you a better musician, that will improve your alternate picking or vibrato, right? It just doesn't make sense. So the same idea is here. And here's the reason why all the top-level athletes or coaches are not scientists. When they talk about science-based lifting, it's purely studies. So practice, huh? Okay. Why then they always talk about anecdotal evidence? What is the anecdotal evidence argument? For instance, smoking is bad. I have a grandfather who used to smoke two packs of cigarettes each day. He was a sailor and he managed to live to 100 years. So in this case, it's the anecdotal evidence argument, which is total BS, right? But when we have conversations sort of, you know, the science-based lifting, if it works so well, why do we have so many professional bodybuilders who do it completely opposite? Plus, on top of that, we have absolutely zero bodybuilders, powerlifters, strongmen, Olympic weightlifters, whatever athletes who do it the science-based way. Maybe it means that this approach is incorrect? Anecdotal evidence! Anecdotal evidence! Listen, what is the point to do science without taking the reality into account? You just gotta look at any, like, look at any, like, actual um, athletes. That's who you should really look for to see what works and what doesn't. You get what I'm saying? And how do they get bigger for the most part? They train, like, heavier and harder. If you go to a varsity gym and look at how athletes train, it's usually pretty bad. Yeah, like, not good range of motion and you know, a bad part of range of motion and like lots of really bad technique. And Most but what's funnier is that they refer to studies all the time. Like, isn't the same thing just on a much smaller scale? And yeah, I get it. It's more controllable, but isolated studies and the practice of like hundreds, thousands of different lifters is basically the same thing. So why do you preach studies but completely neglect and disrespect even, like, the reality. Another important part about the anecdotal evidence is that your training is indeed an anecdotal evidence. But on top of that, those studies are just flooded with flaws. The first flaw is that usually they are conducted in whether untrained individuals or novice lifters. Not everything that works in untrained individuals or novice lifters will work in advanced lifters, guys. Yeah. There was a slight issue. All those studies were on untrained lifters. Already this factor makes everything just shattered and collapsed. But the second problem is that 
those studies are usually conducted in a very short period of time, like it's up to two months at max. Building muscle mass and just adapting to resistance training in general is a very long-term process. Again, especially if you are more advanced. Third, those studies are conducted usually not just in the untrained individuals, but also by the untrained individuals, which actually makes things even worse because there are so many nuances in lifting, guys, that cannot be seen if you never did it. And the fourth problem, which is kind of, you know, not the problem of the studies by themselves, but the people who use those studies as a proof, sophistry. So usually it's being used by the people who have nothing to do with science and especially with the specific one, which is called logic. I already made a whole video on this topic, but briefly. So imagine we gotta figure out the best lat exercise, for instance, it is some cable crap versus barbell rows. Of course, this cable crap is gonna be better than barbell rows in terms of stimulus to fatigue ratio, obviously, but barbell rows also stimulate a bunch of other different muscle groups. So to match this overall stimulus of barbell rows, you gotta do plenty of different exercises. And it's never taken into consideration. And that's, you gotta summarize, you know, this fatigue of all those dozen of different exercises. So it usually doesn't make sense when you compare exercises like this, because we don't train just one muscle group. Many people understandably thought that I think you build a bigger back with a one arm cable pull down than with the barbell row. But I don't think that, and I didn't think that when I made the tier list video. If you were forced to do just one of these exercises for the rest of your life, I would 100% pick the barbell row. So in most of the cases, we're dealing with the sophistry-based lifting. But these were the inner flaws. And there's the last one, which is kind of, you know, the outer flaw, bias. You see, those studies are shallow. Fitness-related studies are usually done by people who try to boost their scientific score. You understand what I'm talking about? Okay. Do you remember this Mr. Mike PhD? You know what, around like a year ago, I paid attention to the fact that his PhD was literally about leaner and more muscular people can jump higher and run faster. If you think about this, it shouldn't exist because it does not answer any question that does not require just using common sense. You see, you can prove it within just 30 seconds. Thicker muscles, on average, can produce more force. If a person weighs the same, but he is leaner, on average, he will have more muscle mass. Thus, on average, he will be able to produce more force doing some movements, like jumping and running. Congratulations! You don't need to do the study. So as a teacher, as a student, as a scientist, you want to be as an author or co-author in as many articles, studies as possible. It can affect your career in the end of the day. And second, when we're talking about bias, why are science-based lifters so hostile towards critique? Isn't it that science should be open for critique because this is how the science evolves? But in most of the cases, I receive comments, sort of, you are dumb, you don't understand science, you are against science. The fact that I critique science-based lifting does not mean that I'm against science. Those people promote something and their earnings depend on it. So of course, they're gonna push it even if they know that they are wrong. And making something like 150 to 200 K per month on YouTube ad revenue, like AdSense that doesn't include sponsors or anything like that. On top of that, guys, any science operates with the precise terminology. When we talk about science-based lifting, what kind of terminology is being used? Think about this. Strict form. Okay, if we go to a gym and you start doing some cheat bicep curls and I go like, listen, man, you're gonna do some strict form today you'll completely understand because this is Jim Bro talk, right? But from the scientific standpoint of view, what is the strict form? Like, what is it? How strict is strict and what does it even mean? What is slow and controlled? How long would you say each negative takes you on average? 
two seconds, maybe. Really? One okay. to two seconds. That's, yeah. Really? Okay, like, that's not yeah. that slow, though. Or, you know, I liked it the most. But I will say, I don't think dips have the smoothest feel. Is it a scientific term? It's Jimbroism, which is completely normal, again, if we don't talk about science. So, it seems pretty weird, huh? You can't use theory to base your lifting upon. The only thing that is empirical being used by science-based lifters is studies, which were totally debunked. Absolutely no precise terminology and some basic concepts. Absolutely zero examples of professional athletes in any sports and lifting related sports especially, which is more important in this case, where we can see that science-based lifting worked. Which makes me think that science-based lifting does not even exist. It's just a total fraud. It's just made up concept. Jesus, what a revelation, huh? Not really. Lots of people will critique me because, oh, what about Mike Monster? What about Dorian Yates? They were science-based guys. Again, Mike Monster, Dorian Yates, Tom Platz have nothing to do with science-based lifting. When we talk about science-based lifting, we mean the modern concept that appeared around like five, ten years ago in the modern fitness industry. And Jeff Nipper, of course, is not science-based because he made all his gains during his powerlifting phase. So he can call himself whatever he wants, but the fact is that his training was not that unusual and differed so much from other gym goers. So he does promote science-based lifting, but it does not mean that he got jacked because of it. So this pseudoscience based lifting is basically the bunch of some gym bro assumptions wrapped in a package of science and promoted to masses. Guys, it's not a new approach. Science always being used to boost the credibility of a product that you want to promote in the market. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Try camels yourself. The cigarette so many doctors enjoy. And the last question, is science-based lifting, like real science-based lifting, possible, theoretically? I think it is. Like in a future world, in a perfect society, it is possible, probably, yeah. But nowadays, it seems like a very complicated task, almost impossible. So I don't think you can use science to boost the efficiency or efficacy of your training. So guys, that's it. I hope everybody who considers himself a science-based lifter will watch this video and leave a comment. Oh my God, you're so dumb. You are against science. Do you know that our body is made of stars and 